God, we thank you for who you are, and we acknowledge your presence uh, in our midst today. God, we know that uh, you here among us is what makes a difference. It, it's, it's what makes a difference uh, in us as a church, God, in our hearts, in our minds uh, here this morning. And so, God, we welcome your presence, and we just say, Holy Spirit, come and have your way uh, in, this, in this day, God, as we, as we uh, spend some time in worship here, as we hear from your word as we share a meal together and go into our annual meeting, God, uh, would all uh, be done uh, in glory and honor of you. Uh, God, we love you uh, for who you are, for what you're up to. Uh, God, we, uh, we just believe you for great things, and we are excited about uh, what you're doing. Uh, God bless us as we, as we spend our time together today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, do a baby dedication this morning. It is my first baby dedication I've ever done, so hopefully it goes well. Right, little guy? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is Alexander and Philip, everybody. Uh, and this is Patrick and Rebecca. I've got to know Patrick and Rebecca a little bit over the last while. Rebecca joined us as a youth leader, and in that time, we got to know you and your family and uh, the, the, the joys and the struggles that you guys were experiencing before Alexander. And we, don't, we won't go into detail, and I won't speak. Uh, Patrick, do you want to speak? No, I know. <laughs> um, but needless to say, Alexander, Alex, Alexander, chubby bunny, uh, Alexander uh, is a gift from God, and that's, I think we can all understand what that means, and he is a blessing, and, and he is heaven, straight from heaven, and uh, the one example that is really similar to the story, as many of us might know, is the story of Hannah, and when, when Hannah is dedicating Samuel to, the t to God in the temple. The Bible doesn't really give us clear instructions on what to do with with babies, but we do see examples of how we're supposed to dedicate our children back to God because it's, it, they are a gift from God, although sometimes they may not feel like it or seem like it. <laughs> but they are. This guy is cute. This guy is adorable. We're not asking you to dedicate him and leave him here. You can take him home afterwards. Um, but we want to uh, help you commit him to God's care and to God's service. This morning, Patrick and Rebecca have agreed to make a declaration to God, to their families, as well as to their church family here this morning, uh, their intentions in raising Alexander to follow God. They're also entering into some accountability, asking us and you for help in bringing up their child as godly parents in this community of Christ followers. We read in Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 6, and you've had a little bit of heads up, so I'll read it for them. But Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter six, 6 says this, Listen, the Lord our God is the only true God, so love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Memorize his laws and tell them to your children over and over again and over and over and over again. Talk about them all the time, whether you're at home or walking along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning. Write down copies and tie them to your wrists and foreheads to help you remember and obey them. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your town gates. And so there are some principles for our families in keeping uh, God's word front and center in our homes, and I hope that you guys will adopt these as well. Love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, and teach him to do the same. Know God in his word. Teach what you know again and again. I've only been a parent for nine years as I've preached before. You'll do it again and again and again and again. Listen well, please. Yeah. <laughs> Give God and his word the central focus in your home and in your family and in everything you do. Your part as parents is to do all you can provide, uh, to do all you can to provide the environment, the examples, the teaching, the prayer, the opportunities for your kids to grow up, to know God. Will you do that? Do you want to say that in the microphone? He's terrified of the microphone, that's why I'm... We as a family have a distinct advantage over many people in our area because we have a huge extended family here in this church. We have two services here this morning. A church family that will come alongside you and work together with you to make this happen. We will teach and mentor and advise and pray for your child. We will support and assist you. Um, we will do whatever we can to help you train your child. We, we will partner with you. Church family, will we as a congregation, as a church family, promise to come alongside them as parents in teaching and caring and advising and praying and supporting them as a godly family? And to that we say, we will. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to try and do this. May I hold him? Yeah. 
Is he going to start crying? No. He's snorting a lot. Hi, buddy. Whoa. I, I got him. <laughs> Someone asked me this morning, you're doing baby dedication? Yep. And you're going to hold him? Yep. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. All right. Father God, this morning I dedicate Alexander Philip to you. Alexander Philip, may you know God early in life. May you grow to center your life around him and his plan. May you know God's voice and be quick to do what he says. And over the course of your life, point many to him. Father God, who gives good gifts, you give us life and breath and days upon days. God, may Alexander Philip breathe from you and in you and through you and for you. May you give him great joy. And Father God, we pray for the Ridgeway, Ridgeways this morning. May you dedicate, or we dedicate their family and their home and their house. We pray, we pray that you will nurture Alexander Philip and mature him through the Holy Spirit. We pray that their home is filled with grace and joy. We pray that they are a family who will continue to be aimed towards you, whose hearts are full of your grace and peace and hope and truth. And so this morning, collectively, we give Alexander to you. We pray for the family. May you cover them with your love. And may you cover all of us with a strong desire to help this family teach Alexander to know God, to become like Jesus, and to change your world. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Charlie is the uh, interim executive director of the Being Christ Church of Canada. He is not uh, uh, new to leadership positions at all. He was a pastor of Wayne Fleet, which is probably the largest congregational church uh, for a number of years and served as well as the, uh, the lead of the community churches of our denomination. And now he stepped into the interim executive director position. So uh, we are really blessed to have you with us this morning. Charlie, or would you come and share with us? Well, thanks for having me here with you today. It's so good to be here when it's not snowing, isn't it? <laughs> Watching the weather report, and I thought, oh, my word, it's not looking good here, but it uh, came up yesterday. It was beautiful, and the sun's shining this morning. Uh, you're going to get a good dose of denominational leaders. Uh, my associate, Todd Lester, is going to be here uh, next week as well. And uh, we um, value your participation in our uh, life together as being, being Christ people across Canada. I'm going to bring you greetings on behalf of our congregations and uh, many different kinds of expressions that we have in the Being Christ. And let you know that uh, we do have a Lent devotional guide. Some of you follow Advent. Lent's a little bit more of a newer tradition. It's a very old tradition, but it's a little bit more... Uh, new for us in the evangelical uh, world. And so we put out this land guide. You want to pay attention to day 21. Dave Brotherton is the author of that day. And uh, follow along with that. I think those are available on the table uh, over to the side. Well, uh, I'm uh, glad that I get this week instead of last week because Dave gave me some latitude to just kind of go wherever I wanted to go today. Last week was Leviticus, I think, or something like that. And so I didn't, I missed that assignment. Shucks. Um, <laughs> going to talk about being for stuff today. And so I want to uh, start uh, this week and just play uh, a little bit of a game, have a little bit of fun today. Uh, we're going to play for and against. Now, I wanna, don't want to shame anybody. We're going to have some public uh, affirmation here. If you don't want to participate, that's okay. Uh, we're not here to shame anybody, but I'm just going to ask you to put up your hand if you're for this or against this uh, thing. And I'm going to uh, give you 10 things today. Once again, uh, don't hold it against anybody if they differ with you, if they're sitting next to you or anything like that. Most of these are fairly... Um, as you see, fairly uh, things that you won't hold a life grudge about, I don't think, okay? So here we go. Uh, for or against? Uh, salty caramel truffle ice cream. Who's for that? Anybody against salty caramel truffle ice cream? Okay, yeah, a few people. Take numbers there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> don't judge. Don't judge. Here's one. I was in Florida this week. We had our church planters retreat, and uh, I, I saw this one. Wearing socks with sandals. Who is for that? <laughs> Against. Every hand should have gone up. 
Jesus would never have done that. I want you to tell that. <laughs> okay, here, here's one that maybe you're going to incriminate yourself on. Going to an express lane at the grocery store with more than 10 items. Are you for that? I won't ask you if you've done that, but you're really kind of outing yourself. Who's against that? You know, you see those people in front of you, and you start counting their cart, and you think to yourself, I'm going to say something, and your spouse is holding you back. Pineapple on pizza. Who's for that? That's such a Canadian thing. Against. Anybody against pineapple on That was invented in Canada. Okay, here's, here's a good one. Don Cherry. Who's for Don Cherry? Every hand should go up. Who, who's against Don Cherry? You and uh, obviously lots of people at Sportsnet. Okay. Uh, quinoa or kale or hummus. Who's for that? Against. Avoid. Regifting Christmas or birthday presents. Who's for that? Yeah. Against. Anybody against that? <laughs> Fundamentally, you wouldn't do that? Okay. Look around. Here's one that is kind of like right now, most families are, are checking in on this one. Cell phones being shut off at mealtimes. Who's for that? Cell phones being shut off at mealtimes. Against. Now, there's a few hands going up down. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> Your girlfriend's calling. It's a different thing, right? Okay. Um, the Canadian government uh, uh, paying for Harry and, Ma Harry and Meghan's security. Who's for that? <laughs> okay. I won't ask for a show of hands on the other side. Okay. <laughs> Lastly, getting something for free. Who's for that? Okay. Well, today's big word is for. This word for, and we're going to talk being, about being for and against. One of the movies that uh, has come out in the last year that uh, I uh, really loved was a movie called uh, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood uh, about Mr. Rogers. Uh, Tom Hanks played uh, Fred Rogers. And uh, in reading a little bit about Fred Rogers' life, I came across uh, this story. Once uh, Fred Rogers was given a daytime, uh, Fred Rogers uh, had a, a television show on public television in the U.S. for years and years. And he was presented with a Daytime Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award. He got up at the uh, presentation, and in his beautiful and gentle way in front of all those people who were just a little bit jaded, uh, said this. All of us, he said, have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you to become who you are? 10 seconds of silence. And then he lifted his wrist, pulled back his sleeve, and began to look at his watch and said softly, go ahead, I'll watch the time. People kind of murmured with laughter, and they started to squirm. And then they realized that Fred Rogers was serious, that he wasn't just uh, some kind of Hollywood hero. He was an authority figure in the room at that time. And he was serious about inviting them to do what he just asked them to do, 10 seconds. He put his watch up, and suddenly something happened. The room got very quiet, and people began to cry all over the place in the audience as the camera panned the room, as they began to think about people in their life that were for them. If you would have been in the audience that day, who would you have been thinking of? Who are the people in your life who have loved you into being, that have been for you, who have brought you to where you are, who were in your corner? Who are they? Throughout my life, I've struggled at times with self-confidence. As a child, I had a terrible fear of going into new places into to new churches. I thought everybody was looking at me. And then God called me to be a pastor and to stand in front of people. And lo and behold, uh, the church I was pastoring started to grow, and we had all kinds of new people, and, and they were staring at me, I thought. 
And I had this little thing that I have in the front of my book right here today that I put here that says this. Father, I love you and you love me. I love these people and you love these people. Love these people through me. This is not an audience to be feared, but a family to be loved. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Who are the people in your life who've been for you that cheer you on when you're feeling afraid and fearful? The great news is that we have people like that in our life. The very good news that I want to remind you of today is that God is for you. That God is for you. And I want to take you to a simple idea and a passage of Scripture that reminds us about that. What does it mean to be for someone? Well, to be for means to be in favor of them, to approve of them, to want the best for someone, to believe in them no matter what, to have their back, to see the potential that they have, to cheer them on, to expect the best, to always speak well of, to sacrifice for, to show love to. And the good news is, that's how God sees us. How do I know that? Well, there's a passage of scripture that reminds me of that. So if you have a Bible, I think there was some available at the back. If you have one on your phone, that's fine with me. Uh, there is the passage of scripture I put in the message notes today, I think. Um, I don't know if those got passed out or not, but Romans chapter 8 is where we are in the scripture today. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through to 39. When I was pastoring, I always assumed that there was going to be new friends with us every week, and so maybe you're in that category today. And uh, I'm finding these days that lots of people have been on the way a long time, and then there's all kinds of other people that are just trying to figure out um, spirituality and figure out what it means to, to be a Christian and to follow Jesus. And so you might come in here today and not know anything about this book that we follow that points us to the one we love, Jesus. Uh, it's called the Bible, and it's uh, divided into two sections. If you let it flop open in the middle, if you have a paper version, you'll generally come to the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle. Uh, I'm telling you to kind of work to your right now. If you work to your right, you'll come to the Newer Testament, we call it, the New Testament. And if you get in the range of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are called the Gospels. Acts, which is the story of the beginning of the church, and then the book of Romans, where we are today, a letter that was written to the church that was founded in Rome. Now, this section of Scripture, just to give you a bit of background, forms a smaller section within the larger book of Romans. That actually begins in chapter 5. If you go back at the start of chapter 5, once again, when these letters were written, there were no chapter divisions or verse divisions. It was just one long letter. Those things were inserted afterwards to help us navigate the letter. And so uh, there's nothing uh, particularly inspired about the chapter and the verse divisions. It just helps us navigate. So Romans chapter 5 through to 8 is actually a section in this larger letter. The trigger word you're looking for here is the word justified. If you look at the start of chapter 5, you'll see uh, it says, therefore, uh, and it talks about being justified. The word justified, uh, without a long explanation, simply means it's just as if we had never sinned. That's how God views us when we come to follow Jesus and believe in Jesus and his finished work on the cross and the hope of the resurrection that we celebrate in Easter upcoming. It's just as if we have never sinned. It's grace that we received. Now, Romans chapter 8 is kind of the concluding, verses 31 to 39, is the concluding part of that whole uh, section. And in verse 28, uh, it begins to talk about, down into verse 30, about being justified again. And it talks about how we are justified. So it's kind of a bringing this whole thought uh, to its summary. So verses 31 to 39 is where we're focusing today. And this summary should really be this like for and against idea. So think for and against and notice the concepts associated with for and against here in this summary. Let me read it for you, follow along. What sh uh, then shall we say in response to this that we're justified? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, 
how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. May the Lord give us understanding of his word today. This passage, this short section of scripture, is really an inventory of our rights and our privileges because of what Jesus has done uh, for us. And somehow, um, we have inherited this great riches, these great riches. It's like we had an uncle that we had long since forgotten about, that we find out put us in the will, and we've inherited this vast sum of money, and we, don't, we didn't plan on getting it. We weren't working for it. It came rather unexpectedly. And we didn't certainly deserve it or earn it. And it's come to us. We've become rich in Christ Jesus. And sometimes when we get something for free, we can start to think that somebody's going to come and take it away from us. That the other shoe's going to drop and we're going to lose it. My mother-in-law lived through the Depression. And when I first got to know her, I found out that she had a stash of canned goods in her house. She had canned goods stashed all over the place. Because she remembered a day when you couldn't go to the store and buy canned goods. And she was trying to store up food in case the depression was going to come back again. She was kind of living, waiting for another depression to come, hoping it wouldn't, but preserving canned goods to weather it out if it did come again. Some of us are kind of like that spiritually. We can't believe our good fortune. We think... God's extended his grace to us, but he's going to come and take it back away from us because fundamentally he's kind of mad at us. That's kind of the picture we carry around of God. In this verse, this passage of scripture, uh, the writer tells us four truths. If God is for us, who can be against us? The writer says. Verse 33, who will bring a charge against us? Spiritually. Verse 34, who will condemn us? Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? In every case, the answer is a resounding no one. No one. No one's going to come and take your grace away from you. It stays with you. N.T. Wright says this, the air of surprise relief pervades this classic section of, of scripture. We look around to see like the woman caught in the act of adultery, who has condemned us, and we find out that they're all gone. Look around and see the many things that threaten to separate us from the powerful love which reaches out to us through the cross and through the resurrection and learn that they are all beaten foes. God is for you. In a world that comes against you, where sometimes you can think things are stacked against you. The good news is today, God is for you. He's fighting for you. He wants you to succeed. He wants to come near to you. I don't know how many times I've tried to, to remind my kids, I'm for you. We are for you. No matter what's going on or what you've done, your mom and I are here for you. The other night, my son was visiting his girlfriend in Toronto, and he hit a patch of black ice and plowed into the back end of another car. And he called me, and his voice was just trembling, and said, um, Dad, I've hit this car. What am, I, what am I going to do? And we just said, like, again, we're for you. I'll come up there. We'll, we'll get you through this. We'll work it out. Don't worry. Are you okay? 
were for you. How many parents out there in this room have done that over and over again for the people you love? And so maybe the starting point today in understanding this passage is understand, first of all, that this is the truth we need to live in. That you need to pause and do a Mr. Rogers moment and just think about how much God has loved you throughout your life, how much he's been for you, and all the people he sent along your way that have helped you and guided you, that he's brought to you. You know, sometimes in life we have people that do come against us. And those messages sometimes stick with us. I don't know if your parents were always for you. Some of us didn't have that blessing. If you got a B, you were asked why you didn't get an A. Maybe that's the voice that you kind of have stuck playing in your mind. Maybe it's your own insecurities or some setbacks and rejections that you've had, a job loss, a financial reversal in your life. Faith, the life of faith starts with believing God is for us. That he's not against us, that he's very much for us. And out of that truth, when we get kind of soak in that truth, when we internalize that truth, which I think we have to over and over and over again, then we can begin to live together in a new message and present a different message. Unfortunately, in our brokenness, sometimes communities of faith end up being perceived as people out there in the community perceive the church as being against stuff, against them. Sometimes the people that are supposed to be Jesus to you have actually just been mean and nasty people in your life. Tony Campolo tells the story of the early days in ministry when he was sent to a small rural church, and he discovered a young woman in the town had become pregnant and was not married. The word was out and the gossip was uh, everywhere about her. My wife and I went to see her and sat in her living room explaining the forgiveness of God and how God wills for each of us to be able to make a new start. The young woman quite unexpectedly responded with great brokenness and gave her life to Jesus. He says, I recall, I watched joy come across her face that an hour before had been marked with extreme sadness. I wasn't surprised when she showed up at church in response to our invitation the following Sunday. And then she showed up again the week after that and the week after that. And then suddenly, after three weeks, she stopped coming. My wife and I went to see her again and asked why she wasn't coming to church anymore. And she said, I can't. Every time I go into that church, I get the feeling that I'm dirty and I'm no good. And Tony and his wife said, you shouldn't feel that way. Jesus has forgiven and Jesus has forgotten. And she responded, Jesus may have forgiven and Jesus may have forgotten, but the people down at your church aren't like Jesus. They haven't forgiven and they haven't forgotten. When we don't live in this truth that God is for us, it's pretty tough to be able to send the message out to other people that God is for them. You ever seen somebody advertising a product that you get the distinct feeling that they really don't believe in what they're telling you? They just got paid to do the commercial? I talked to somebody sometime that went to a, a muffler shop that said that you were a somebody if you went to the muffler shop. I've talked to a few people and they didn't feel like a somebody when they went to the muffler shop. We call people into this life we have. We call people into the life we lead. And it shouldn't be that difficult if we just keep reimagining the people in our lives that have been for us. I think back to Lauren, my youth leader, who was always for me. He gave me my first summer job. I don't know why. He had a grass cutting business, and I, I didn't know a lot about cutting grass. I don't know whether I did it very well, but he kept picking me up, and he gave me a summer job, and he actually paid me, and then he, he would buy me a Coke at lunchtime, and he'd take an interest in my life and ask me about it. And an, an older friend named Earl, Earl Winger, who uh, led 
a ministry in our church to shut-ins. They'd go around and visit shut-ins and take them a bulletin. In the early days, he took them a cassette tape of the service, and then later on, he took them a CD, and then um, most of them were past the point where they actually wanted to listen to the service anyway. They just wanted to visit. And then Earl would phone me up at the most strange times, and he'd say to me, he would, Earl was old school. He called everybody brother or sister. He'd get me on the phone and say, Brother Mashiner, I was just spending some time with Jesus, and he, I just felt impressed that I should call you and pray with you here on the phone. And he would. And I don't know how many times Earl would seem to call at the time when I just really needed something. Earl's kind of like tuned in to God. He was for me. He wanted to tell me that all the time. Two questions today. Do you believe, really deep in your soul, that God is for you? If you do anything today, start there. Just over this Lenten season, just drink that in. And remember the people in your life that have been for you. And remember how much God is for you. Think about Romans 8. And then secondly, who are you for? Who are you for as individuals and as a church? I believe this church is a lighthouse in this community. It's not just a piece of architecture that you put on the front of your building. It's going to be beautiful, I think. But it's just kind of a parable about what you're supposed to be together that you're bringing light to this community, that you're telling this community, we're for you. Jeremiah 29, verse 7, Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles. And these people were hoping they'd get a letter from Jeremiah saying, God has told me that he's going to get you out of here right away. But that's not what happens. He says to them, settle in there for a while because God has you there for a while. And at the right time, I'll bring you home. But for now, you're going to be there, and you're going to be there for quite a while. And then he says this, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have called you and carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. In other words, as you bless your community, the Lord is able to bless your church. You are put in this community to help it to prosper. And as you do that, the blessing begins to return to you. It's a strange principle of Scripture here. As it prospers, you too will prosper. And my prayer for you as a church is that God would help you just to unfold blessing in this community, that people in this community and beyond, all around here, in the Great Bruce area, would know that this church is here blessing people and blessing the community, and it's an outpost of blessing. I believe God wants to multiply that through your church and is already doing that. The blessing you give comes back to you. We were a hockey-playing family. My kids grew up playing hockey, and we spent a lot of time at the arena. My son's getting married in a couple of weeks, and I was talking to a couple of guys in his wedding. I used to prepare my sermon at hockey practice. Um, so I take my son to hockey, I go down to the end of the rink, get my Bible out on the on the bench there, and a couple of guys said, I remember you were preparing your sermon at the hockey arena. It's just so weird. <laughs> and uh, tried to do my, my best to kind of bless those guys and tell them about Jesus. And so uh, my son's team, you know, when, when the team is not playing well, the coach calls a timeout and calls all the team over to the bench and proceeds to ream on them. You know, just tell them, like, you guys are playing awful. Get with it. Try harder. Whatever else you say as a coach. So we're at this game, and my son's team is like winning the game, and they're playing really well. And all of a sudden, the coach calls a timeout and calls them all over to the bench. And we're just kind of trying to figure out, as parents up in the stands, what on earth is going on here? Anyway, they come back out and play, and they win the game. They were winning the game anyway. I don't know why he called them over there. I get my son in the car on the way home, and I said to him, 
What on earth was Mark trying to do? Call you over to the bench. What did he say to you? And this is what my son said. He said to us, you know, guys, I usually call you over the bench because we're losing or the game's close and I have to yell and scream at you. But, like, we're playing really well today. So I thought I would call a timeout and call you over to the bench and just say to you, way to go. You're doing great. Don't change anything. You're doing great. Today, I want to say to you, as a denominational leader, we're for you, and we're, you're doing great as a church. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. I believe God wants to say to you, I love you. I'm for you. I want to do new and beautiful things in and through you, but I love you just the way you are right now. That's the good news of the gospel that we have to share with those around us. It's the good news we live in that we celebrate when we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We live in the power of his death and what was accomplished, but the hope of the resurrection. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you today that you're for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? And so help us to drink that in and remember that today. Thank you for this church. Salvo Christian Fellowship, a lighthouse, a beacon of hope for people in this area. I pray that it would be known as a place of blessing, be known as a church that's for people and for this community and is rediscovering new and beautiful ways to bless other people's lives. May you continue to new, do new things. May you bring people to this church to find life. May people that are thinking of sleeping in on Sunday morning be suddenly awoken and drawn to the doors of this church and maybe sitting in the parking lot for a few minutes trying to get up the courage to come in. And may they feel as they come through the doors of this church that they've come home and that you want to love on them. Father, thank you for these people. Bless them. Bless uh, the program that they're engaged in right now, building a, a larger facility. I pray your blessing upon it for the finances that are needed. Pray for Pastor Dave and his health as he leads this congregation. I pray that you bless uh, him and um, strengthen him and heal him. Thank you, Lord, for your provisions and your blessing. We give all these things and ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.